Hey, folks, we are going to do something uh, a little bit different today. This episode will be in two parts. First, we are going to re-air an episode that is very dear to me, in which I travel across the country and talk with some special guests who I know very well, all about road trips, about travel, and about what it means to travel as you age. Then in the second half, there is a sponsored bonus conversation that's also about road trips and electric vehicles that I had with none other than astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. So stay tuned for that. Now, on to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Atlas Obscura. And today, we're going to do something that we, we once in a while do, which is instead of telling you about a specific place, we try to answer a question from you, the audience, or sometimes uh, it's posed to me by a colleague. We're going to talk about a pretty deep question about travel, about life. And this question, the thing that sparked this episode, was asked by my colleague Camille. Camille asked me if there was anything on my travel list that I was saving for a particular moment in my life. And Camille, if you thought you could ask me a simple travel question without it turning into some kind of vast existential uh, quandary about growing old, you underestimate me. I'm Dylan Thuris, and this is Atlas Obscura, a celebration of the world's strange, incredible, and wondrous places. And in this Q&A episode, I'm talking about travel, aging, and to some very special people who have been through it all and who maybe can tell me about what awaits. Hello. 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 (laughs) That's after this. Act one. Travels of the Young and Reckless. So this question about what kind of travel you might save for a particular time in your life got me thinking about where I am in my own life and travel journey. You know, as a kid, my travel was pretty modest. It meant road tripping around the Midwest, long, endless road trips. But they definitely made an impression. When I was 12, we stopped at this place in Wisconsin, the House on the Rock, It's got the world's largest indoor carousel. It's got a squid fighting a whale the size of the Statue of Liberty. You know, and as a 12-year-old, I thought, if this is what's in the woods of Wisconsin, what else is in the world? You know, that sort of set me on this journey, gave me that very initial spark, the travel spark. Uh, And after I graduated high school, I, you know, gathered my meager savings and went on this crazy two-month journey through Europe with my best friend Alex. It was this ridiculous trip. We slept on the train. We were in a new city every day. I drank a giant uh, stein of beer at a monastery in Germany. I was only 17. No one cared. It was amazing. We also got robbed twice in a week. Anyway, that was kind of the early years, this, this time of just free, unplanned travel. And... After college, my wife and I took probably the most consequential trip of our lives. It was it was the last truly great, you know, uh, just diving off the deep end, no idea what's what's on the other side. We moved to Budapest for a year, and we traveled all over to Romania, to Serbia. And as we traveled, we sought out these, you know, strange little museums, self-built castles. And Alice Obscura was born, you know, at least in part from that period of exploration that we did in Eastern Europe. These days, travel is a decidedly uh, different affair. One one might even say a less romantic experience. Uh, I've got two young kids. I've got a four and a six-year-old. And these, these plane trips and these big international trips have mostly given away to domestic road trips, trips involving a lot of bathroom stops, uh, constant flow of snacks. Uh, my like, I'm usually in the passenger seat. My, my wife loves to drive, so I am like covered in crumbs and wrappers by the end of these trips. And basically, these trips just have a lot of compromise in them. On our recent road trip from New York to Minnesota to see my folks, we drove past so many amazing things. We drove past this incredible abandoned turnpike in Pennsylvania. I've wanted to see it for a long time. We were so close. We were like 10 miles away. 
But it was a super hot day out. The kids were crabby. And we drove past it. You know, like, this is just what travel is like now. So, you know, in the arc of my travel life, I have distinctly entered Act Two, the Middle Ages. I, I know this because I recently uh, found myself Googling the question, do they make Converse with arch support? And it turns out they don't. Uh, you know, I'm not sure when a midlife crisis starts, but I did, I did come across something that I found a little bit discouraging, which is that a recent study from the National Bureau of Economic Research suggests that there is this kind of universal midlife slump, a, a median most unhappy age. And it turns out to be 47.2. That's still a little ways away, but it's not an unthinkable distance away. And it, it makes me wonder if my most unhappy time is, is ahead of me. Is it all downhill from here? Is, is life now from Act 2 just a slide into grouchiness and aching knees? Uh, you know, is my travel, have I already had my best experiences in the world? That is worrying. I don't like that. But as I thought about this and wondered about whether I was saving travel and what that would mean, instead of sort of just lying down on the ground and and moaning, I thought it could be a good idea to ask some people who've already been through all of these life phases and have traveled all along the way and see what they had to say about the matter. Oh, well, first, hello. 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 <laughs> hello. So first question, uh, what are your names? Barbara Thuris. Roger Thuris. And uh, how, how do we know each other? You're our grandson. You are the first grandson. <laughs> That's right. I am visiting home for a month, and I interviewed my grandparents. This is a little bit of a personal question, but uh, if you don't mind my asking, how how old are you, you two? I am uh, 84. I am 86. By the way, both of us grew up in, in during World War II, we had no travel. Yeah. You couldn't travel. You couldn't get gas uh, and, and you know, war effort. Nope, no travel. And so we didn't. So they didn't really travel much as kids because of World War II, but they really made it up as adults. And we'll call this period of their travel the escaping. Do you remember, you know, when you first sort of traveled together? Oh, yes. We traveled um, six months after, after after your dad was born. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. We left him with Barb's folks, and we took a trip to um, Colorado. Colorado. So these first, these early trips were a little bit about escaping your children. Yes. Exactly. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. They were. Yeah. After this period of, of great escapes from their children came the kind of epic family road trips, the, the, the moment that I am entering right now. We traveled to Mexico with all three kids in a sedan. You or, drove yeah. from Minnesota to Mexico. Yes. 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 For three, we were gone for, for three, three weeks. weeks. <laughs> three weeks. And these road trips, of course, they weren't always pretty. They were like the road trip I just took, you know, filled with yelling and, and grouchiness and just the needs of, you know, little human beings. So it was, uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah. when are we going to be there? Yeah, are we there Type. yet? And um, well, we drove and. Uh, Renault Dauphine oh, yeah. car <laughs> yeah. uh, that uh, happened to have seven flat tires. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. There was a long stretch where there was no place to stop. Uh, and we got stuck in a, in a roadside parking lot yeah. overnight. And had to sleep in the car. Sleep in the car. With the kids. With, With the, the kids. kids. <laughs> right, right. Do you, do you think that there are certain times in your life when certain travel is, like, does certain travel match certain periods of your life? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. definitely. But finally, 
after the escapes, after the insane epic road trips, my grandparents drove like hundreds of thousands of miles road tripping with the kids. Uh, there was my grandparents' own act three. The no kids, no rules, no agenda years. We spent a week in, first of all, New York, second, London, third, Paris, a week in each. Yes. We had no, no scheduled. And no agenda. No agenda. Once they were yeah. out of the house and, and you were able to retire, you took some big sort of more dream trips that maybe you, but you kind of traveled no matter what the circumstances. It seems like you prioritized those travels. Right. And we, we, we always felt, I don't know, because we were denied it or whether we, travel was a, was a uh, stimulating thing for us. It was uh, sometimes a very romantic thing for us. I, I remember our, our trip to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like another honeymoon sort of Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Any rate. Uh... I have to say, <laughs> I did not expect this, but seeing your 84 and 86-year-old grandparents blush is, that is a, that is a sight to behold. But it was wonderful. And, you know, my own act three, obviously, is ahead of me. But hearing their stories of all periods of travel in their life was enormously encouraging. Not just because of what came after this this dreaded 47.2, but also the value of the kind of travel that they got from what I was doing now, from this period of unromantic travel, this driving cross-country with the kids screaming in the back of the car. It's, It's both terrible and wonderful at the same time. Because of our experience, we felt traveling with the kids was very important for them. Why, why was that? Because they would learn, as we learned from our early traveling experiences, that it's something they needed to go with, go through, give them a sense of um, adjusting to different situations, different cultures, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just, um, we just felt it was very positive. And I felt this in the form of my parents' road trips, generation after generation, taking their kids on trips, encouraging them to experience more pieces of the world and giving their kids the gift of travel in in whatever form it, it came. It didn't have to be some elaborate international trip. It could literally just be a drive across the state. So I think this leads me to the answer to your question, Camille. Is there anything on my travel list that I'm saving for a particular moment in my life? Look, I definitely am looking forward to those no agenda times post kids, but I'm not sure I want to save any of it. I I can't know what the rest of my life is going to look like. So I figure let's dive in now. Do the travel we can. Don't necessarily hold things off. Uh, We'll we'll get there when we get there. Let's just Let's just go where we can with all its the flat tires and the old bananas. I think that's the way I'm thinking about it. Don't wait for some imagined future. Get in the car and start driving now. We feel that's uh, for most people, kids or no kids, whatever, travel is a good thing. But, you know, good planning and and good luck. (laughs) (laughs) So, whatever act of life you're in, kids, no kids, may all your travels have good planning and good luck. Great. All right. Yeah. Now we can go back to, to having a normal uh, barbecue. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming with me on this, this question and answer journey uh, today. And I'd love to hear from all of you about if you're saving travel for a particular time in your life. Do you have a dream trip that you're just waiting to take? Or what about the joys of travel after the dreaded 47.2? I would love to hear about all of this. Give us a call at 315-992-7902 or send us a voice memo and email it to hello at atlasobscura.com. I can't wait to hear from you. Next up is the sponsored bonus conversation that I had with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It was all about the future of electric cars, about travel, and the joys of road tripping. 
Hey, Star Talk fans. This next segment is sponsored by the all electric Chevrolet Bolt EUV, the everyday electric vehicle for everyday people. That's us. Atlas Obscura host Dylan Thuris joined in for a fascinating Cosmic Queries conversation about the future of electric vehicles. The all electric Chevy Bolt EUV has so many cool features, including the ability to engage in conversations hands free with the industry's first hands free driving assistance technology. Got with me my co host Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil. Yes, man. So, you know, I know you're concerned about the environment and people may not believe, but I am too. And so, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. I believe you, Chuck. Yeah. We, so we had the opportunity to partner with the Chevrolet Bolt EUV and I was able to take a tour. Super excited about this because I mean, this is the future. This is the future right now and they're making it really exciting. Wait, wait, wait. So wait. So EUV. Is that like SUV, except it's got like electric as the first letter? Man, there you go. Can't, gotta wake Am up I smart? early. I'm smart. Gotta wake up early. <laughs> <laughs> gotta wake up early. <laughs> I figured that one out. Yeah, no, that's super cool. Very, man. Yeah. very, very cool. Well, thank and you, by the way, I'm like, by, what? by the way, now that you bring that up, the cool thing about it is pretty roomy. EUV, five passenger, you know what I mean? Comfortable and, uh, and, and and looks looks good too. All right, we're not and doing I'm a not, commercial here, any... people. I'm just excited about the car. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not getting in any car unless it's got leg room because my legs <laughs> need some space. There you so go. just got leg room. Oh yeah, without a doubt, bro. Oh man. Okay. okay. I'm just, just, just Stop making me guts over this car. Wait. By the way, this really <laughs> is the future. I'm telling you right now. I'm so excited. I've been waiting for electric vehicles to come and be accessible to everybody. And you know. Okay, but this this show ain't about you and your electric vehicle. I know. It's I about know. transportation and travel. And I have a special guest for that. All right. And it's it's Dylan Thuris. Dylan is the host of atlas obscura atlas obscura and it's a show about travel and finding all the weird wacky cool things in the world that wouldn't show up in a normal atlas all right hence the subtitle obscura and in fact i didn't even remember this until i said definitely why do i remember and then i i, I own the man's book <laughs> the man has a book uh, with that title and came out a few years ago and th he didn't send it to me I got this on my own accord and it's a big fat book and it's beautifully illustrated and it's a discussion it's a celebration of all things in the world that people do and participate in and worship and and visit so uh, I think if we're gonna take electric cars into the future people like Dylan are gonna want to care about are they gonna serve his needs so, Dylan, welcome to Star Talk. Hey, Neil, thanks for having me, and uh, I'm thrilled that you had a copy of the book on the shelf. That's a delight. Yeah. So, Dylan, I'm going to ask you to send me a copy because, unlike Neil, I don't buy books. <laughs> <laughs> what? You, you got it, Chuck. You'll get, you'll get one with a with an autograph coming your way. <laughs> so, do you have questions about this this future of electric cars, given given your professional life? Yeah, I do. I, so I, I just went on an enormous road trip with my two kids, my four-year-old and my six-year-old. And uh, we drove out to Minnesota and, and back Sweet. again. From uh, where? To From see where? my parents. From New York. From New, New York. York State to mm -hmm. Minnesota. So mm -hmm. 1,500 miles or whatever. And we... Wait, wait. I have to ask. I have to yeah. ask. How soon yeah. did they say, are we there yet? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> oh, that's that's the constant refrain. I mean, truly, it is like a timeless, ageless yes. refrain. Yes, yes. Uh, and it starts, it starts although, 11 minutes in. Chuck still says it when his wife is driving. Are you, you know, kidding? Are we there yet? Yes. Yeah. And, we're, and we're only going to the market. <laughs> <laughs> My son follows along on the GPS and kind of tells us, like, oh, you got a turn coming up. Like, what's the time say? Nice, so, nice. Very yeah, nice. Yeah, he's integrated mm -hmm. with the experience. But uh, doing this drive we were on the interstate then for part of the time we took the back roads and and you could see the ways that the highway infrastructure has changed the country over the years and i'm curious about how you guys think that the chevy bolt and electric vehicles will will change that infrastructure going forward how, how's it going to re remake the landscape so so from what i've seen early electric vehicles let's go back you know 10 years or so a little longer perhaps they were really designed for just bouncing around town. They were small. They weren't very um, interesting to look at necessarily. And uh, so you charge it up, you might get 100 miles on a charge or 60 miles, something like that. But that was plenty 
to just commute into town and come back home and charge up overnight. And so uh, that that had a little, it was a very niche market in the early days. And then people said, no, I want to, if I'm going to have a car and I'm going to switch over, I want to drive longer distances. And so, okay, that means you need bigger batteries, more batteries. This is not, okay. And so how, how many miles is good enough? Now take a look at the map of the earth. And it's pretty well, quote, settled from coast to coast, unless you're in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And by settled, you can ask, how far away from you uh, are you from the nearest reasonably sized city? And I don't know that you could be more than 100 miles from any reasonably sized city, no matter where you are in the United States. That's how populated we are across this country. So what I noticed was that early electric car folks, um, and then third party participants to say, let's put charging stations with enough frequency across the country so that you can pull in and put it near a coffee shop or something. So you just take a break and top off your tank, your quote tank. So from what I've seen and, and, and Chuck, what do you know about the charging network across the country right now? I am really, so the coolest thing, which excites me is that there are 40,000 plus uh, public charging stations that will allow you to plan your trip and and then the car itself, and this is most exciting, this car has a range of nearly 250 miles, okay, on a full charge. Well, any two big cities near each other are closer than 250 miles. So yeah, if you can get me between 240, 250 miles, I'm going, I'm going city hopping. <laughs> I'm not in the car, right? As, as long as, as Northern Canada and, and Russian Siberia are not on your route, yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah. you will and never be farther way, away from a charge. What freak puts that on their route? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Dylan. Okay. <laughs> that's all right, but, uh, that's that's interesting. One thing I was thinking about is is you know their electric vehicles are a lot quieter than cars, and there's something called the Lombard effect, which is basically because of all the background noise, birds and frogs and other animals sort of have to shout and they change their pitch to be heard. And I wonder over time, with a full switch to electric vehicles, if the the soundscape will change, if they they will start to. Oh, that's a great that's a great to, question. To so I've, I've I've thought a lot about this. So almost the entire noise you're hearing from an electric car is the sound of the wheels against the pavement and and the air moving over the over the body so on a freeway your car still makes noise uh it's just not the noise of the engine and lately last decades car engines internal combustion engine engines have gotten quieter themselves so you go back to the 1950s and 60s you know a car is coming down the road when it's half you know practically a half a mile away and you go really far back like to one of the you know anything from the three stooges or the keystone cops the the cars are like you know belching out things and popping and you know and you're getting backfiring. the backfiring of the engine yeah yeah so that's just a comment about how much noise it makes i can tell you this that uh in an electric car the if you have a stereo system in there it's way better okay because there's usually the stereo has to compete with the rest of the noise that's going on in the car and so it's more of a sanctuary an acoustic sanctuary that you can create un under those conditions and yeah you don't have to scream over each other in the car but if you have two kids i don't think they're thinking about that <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah well, that won't yeah. help me that won't help me at all <laughs> yeah it doesn't the quiet car doesn't make your kids quieter i don't think that would work it works that way and by the way chuck you said forty thousand charging stations mm -hmm. i can't even think where to put those and if that's how many are out there i, I think this is a non-concern for anybody i yeah listen it, it, when you look at the whole usage you know it's kind of purposeful it's futuristic but the technology is here right now and that's what make i don't know who wouldn't want to do this you know like right, why would right. you want to do and, this and and dylan what how long i mean that's a long road trip and we were, were you the only yeah. driver no actually my wife does the majority of the driving i didn't learn to drive till i was like 34 and she doesn't trust me at all so, so, so you're did from new 90 york percent of the, you're from new york i then. i 
Yeah, I wasn't originally, but I was here early enough that I basically never got around yeah. to it. Yeah, I think my kids are going to turn out to yeah. be just like you because they're they're in their twenties and they don't they don't even want to learn how to drive. My kids uh, don't as, even as call me New dad Yorkers. anymore. They call they call me Uber. <laughs> <laughs> you call you Uber? Yeah, as, soon as I walk funny. in the door, my kids are just like, "Hey, Uber, <laughs> <laughs> take me here, take, take me, me here." here. So, so to, for, I guess this is a question for you, for you or for your wife. When you're on long stretches of road, that can get kind of yeah. monotonous, and you can end up drifting. Yeah. Chuck, what's the latest on that from uh, self-driving cars? You know, the uh, cool thing might is, bar do we get it from self-driving cars? What's up there? I gotta say that the cool thing about this car is that it does have a driver assist feature that allows you to kind of, if you want to hang out with your kids, you can do that. You know what I mean? You can have a conversation and- the Wait, Chuck, we just agreed that's what an Uber driver is. That's a driver assist <laughs> so that you can play with your kids. <laughs> you get a whole human being to do that. You're saying we don't need the human being. I get no, you it. Don't, I get you don't it. need okay. the human being. You know, the technology is in the steering wheel and the dash and it allows you to, it monitors your eyes. So it's not just a driver assist, it's a safety assist as well which I kind of like that, you know, because I have young kids, mm -hmm, as you mm -hmm. know, you know, so. Right. Uh, I think one of the things that's exciting to me about that is, is, you know, when you go off the interstate and you take the back roads, it's a much more interesting, exciting experience. You see so much more. You can stop at these little local right. restaurants. And the idea of maybe making driving a little less painful an experience a little more free i think it might free people up to take basically the the back road and I, uh and then do more that is stuff. so cool when you say that I interesting was, thought yeah. interesting thought i was yeah. thinking about that this weekend because i have a motorcycle and i drive back roads right and so yeah. my wife goes with me and as we're driving i'm trying to look because it's it's beautiful you're in this bucolic yeah. setting i'm like and she keeps slapping my helmet like ahead ahead look ahead so it's the same thing you know with the super cruise you know technology you could that's a really great thought that i didn't even consider uh, look around and enjoy no no to start talk producers please increase the insurance on chuck's life <laughs> having just learned that he rides motorcycles on back roads okay <laughs> <laughs> Never knew that about you, Chuck, until this moment. Just yeah, let, let, yeah, yeah. I love, I love it. Man. <laughs> but you know, I I can't wait till they get Super Cruise technology on a bike, so I can actually, <laughs> so I can see where I'm going. I can enjoy it. <laughs> so, so Dylan, do you, so do you think? Uh, I mean, this 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 is the kind of technology that you're going to be thinking about very seriously going forward. Yeah, I, I I'm really excited about the ways that the electric vehicles might change the driving infrastructure of the U.S. and hopefully bring back some of the the kind of small town pit stops, uh, maybe reduce the need for the amount of highway space that we have and just kind of like make that sort of travel a more pleasant, integrated experience, you know, get everyone well, off the interstate a little bit. Not to put words in your mouth, but what you're saying is driving shouldn't just be I have to get from here to there. Driving should be on route from here to there, what can I see? Totally, totally. That's the only, as far as I'm concerned, that's the only way to to, to travel. Mm. Hey, Neil, you know, we're talking about hands-free driving, so just want to say always pay attention while driving and when using the Super Cruise for compatible roads. And don't use any handheld device. And view Chevrolet.com slash electric slash Super Dash Cruise for compatible roads which is super cool. Okay. Dylan, it's been a delight to have you on here. And and, and the, the book is, is fun and your show is even more fun because it's a living version of these travel stories. And so thanks for being on Star Talk. My pleasure. It was, it was a real delight to talk to you guys. Witness Docs from Stitcher.